I'll just start off. My name is uh, Dr. Donnie Wilson, and um, I'm an English professor. And um, I started writing uh, in 2013 when the Houston Chronicle ran an essay I wrote. And then since then, I've been writing for, I wrote for Houstonia Magazine online for their arts channel a while. And now I mostly write for the Houston Chronicle. And I like to do personal essays and reviews in the world of the arts. So um, I'll just have everyone introduce themselves since I can't see anyone. And I think that way you can tell everyone what, what your specialties are. So Ruth, you wanna go ahead? Sure, thanks. Hi, I'm Ruth Nasrullah. I'm a freelance journalist based in Houston. I've also written for the Houston Chronicle personal essays. So um, I started out uh, writing about religion and I've kind of shifted now more to nature and the environment and I'm working on merging the two. So um, happy to, to be here. Wonderful. I can't see any other names, so I'll just have to have everyone jump in. Sure, I can go next if it's okay, everyone. Um, okay, hey, everyone, great. my name is Mark Habib. I am based in Houston as well. I was born in Houston area. And I started writing when I was in college. My first novel came out in 2014. And since then, I've had nine novels published and about 24, 30 shorter works published. And I started writing in the thriller genre, but since then, I've kind of transitioned more to historical fiction, historical nonfiction. And you know, sometimes I, I do still dabble in thriller, sci-fi as well. Wonderful. All right, who's next? I'm happy to go. Um, my minute. name is Anjali Jetty. I am based near Atlanta. Um, I'm the author of two books, Southbound, which is a collection of essays and the novel, The Parted Earth. And I teach in an MFA program at Reinhardt University. Um, but I've been writing for magazines and newspapers for about 20 years now. Um, I've always done it as a freelance writer, so I've never been a staff anywhere. But um, I write uh, a lot about politics. I write a lot of literary criticism for various magazines and newspapers. Um, I interview authors, especially. Um, and I write, um, I write essays as well for various publications. So glad to be here. That's wonderful. All right, I think we, did we have one more person? Yes, um, my name is Chris Lewis. Uh, I've been uh, practicing law for over 20 years. Uh, most of what I write, I guess you'd call persuasive nonfiction. Um, I, uh, I guess I, I do have some background doing peer reviewed research, which is probably not what most people are looking to write. But um, I uh, also under a pseudonym have published uh, on um, financial websites, uh, on investment topics. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I, I guess in, in my practice, I've, I've done things ranging from um, working with uh, entrepreneurs and small businesses all the way to, you know, Fortune 5 companies to um, things like criminal defense. Um, I, I do a lot of uh, transaction support and uh, have some experience with compliance um, and, you know, interfacing with agencies that, you know, need an explanation why what your client did was lawful and hey, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, I think this is fantastic because everyone kind of has a different emphasis on what they're pursuing. And I think that's that's the perfect panel because everyone's coming to the table with something different. So um, I think what I'd like to do is uh, start off with everyone just giving some advice about freelancing, uh, maybe what has worked for you, what hasn't worked for you, what would you advise someone starting out? Um, and let's just begin there and then we'll kind of have a conversation about that and then um, maybe take some questions from the participants. So, uh, so Chris, would you mind starting us off and just giving some advice because you're covering a lot of territory? Yeah, um, I, I think that there are a number of places, especially online, where one can submit without having some kind of special background. I, I think that, you know, while it's nice to have a bio that you know, positions you as having some authority in your area, uh, or at least, you know, some background. Um, a lot of the time, I think the, the thing that you write is what's going to sell or not sell uh, your work. I, I know people who publish essays on sites like Medium. 
Um, I've published uh, financial analysis on uh, Seeking Alpha, which you know, you know, people are interested in you know reading about stocks and things like this. Um, but anything you write, I mean, even if the subject seems like it would be dry to somebody else, you know, it it's on you to make it interesting, and you can tell a story about anything. I mean, I, I think that a, a number of the pieces that I've written on companies that I wanted to discuss as investments, um, you know, were selected as editor's picks and got a lot of traffic because I was telling a story that interested people and people wanted to hear about it and they found it convincing and it helped them make decisions about what to do with their money. And you know, there's a lot of people who are trying to figure out what do they want to do, you know, with, you know, money they have in a retirement account or, you know, what they should be doing with savings and, you know, how to worry about, you know, inflation risks and things like this. And, you know, you don't have to know everything, but if you can tell somebody something that's convincing and true and relevant about something that you know about, there will be some audience for that. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to 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 mention um, because I got my start with the Chronicle blogging, and since this is sort of focused on digital, I thought I'd mention that sure. blogging is, of course, unpaid, but it was a very popular blog, and I kind of got my name out there, and I had tons of clips. But it's very controversial among freelancers whether or not you should write for free ever but I've done it. That's how I got started. Um, and when I, I had gone away and done other things for a little while, and when I came back to journalism in 2020, I wrote for free the entire year, the entire year. <laughs> and, you know, fortunately I was able to transition once I had some clips into now making money again. So while that's not, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, on principle, you shouldn't be doing work that other people could be paid for. Sometimes that's what you've got to do. So, yeah, you know. I, I agree with that, Ruth. And I have to tell you, uh, I had a column for a long time on uh, Downton Abbey, uh, which was a show on PBS. Uh, and I did not get paid for that column. It was through Gray Matters, Lisa Gray's mm -hmm. uh, column through the Houston Chronicle. However, I'm not a trained journalist. I'm an English professor and I learned to meet deadlines. I learned mm -hmm. a lot of stuff and now I do get paid from the Chronicle. So, you know, I, I totally see what you're saying. Sometimes you have to start where you are and uh, that is a way to get some clips and experience and uh, it, can, it, it can pay off. It just might take a little doing, but I think that's a reality. Like some publications, they don't, you know, maybe it's a literary publication. They don't have the funds to pay everyone. Uh, sometimes that's, uh, there's a budget constraint with certain editors. I mean, there's, there, there are so many factors into that, but I, I really think that was good. You brought that up. Uh, and sometimes you have to figure out why you're writing the piece. Uh, and sometimes you're not writing it for money. There's a different reason. I would underscore that things that you do to advertise yourself are not working for free and they're not taking somebody else's job. They're building yours. And right. the, the fact that you might not get paid in advance doesn't mean that you can't be paid later. I mean, I, I personally know people whose, you know, all of the expenses and all of their savings, everything they spend, their whole budget for their family comes from their blog. Nobody pays them to write the article, but they're, you know, they're, they're writing on a subject where there's a lot of advertising money. Uh, they're, they're paid by advertisers. Uh, they get approached because they were writing their blog. You know, they, they've built this into a business that's employing full-time several people now. So the, the fact that you're doing a blog, I mean, that's not to say that, you know, you're going to make a small business out of your blog, but it, it's not inevitable that not being paid up front or not being paid with a contract to be paid promptly thereafter pigeonholes you somehow. You know, there, there are places like, you know, Medium and other folks where you're paid by the click. 
And, you know, there are places where, uh, you know, if you're on your own blog, you might be reimbursed depending on the value of the ads that happen to be shown. And, you know, if, if, if you happen to be writing about something where somebody has high dollar paying ads, you might be paid uh, vastly out of proportion to the labor that went in. You know, if you compare four articles that you wrote, one of them might, you know, generate a lot of money because the advertisers that are being placed on that article are different. <laughs> I mean, and you don't necessarily have control when you write it, you know. Yeah, and one thing I would add, if I can, sure. um, you know, one thing I've learned is to write what you would want to read. If something you want to read, it's probably a good chance that no one else wants to read that. It might be something unique to you. And kind of going off what everyone else said, and I always say, even with books or even with articles, you start small. Like we talked about, you know, think how, find a blog to publish you, find a small paper to publish you. But what you're doing is in the beginning, in the beginning, you're kind of building your resume, right? And like uh, Don, Donnie was saying, it's going to pay dividends later on. It's kind of like when you were in college and you had an unpaid internship for a few months. It's kind of the same way in writing. The first thing you write, write might not get be paid for. It's kind of building your resume so that when you have bigger opportunities, you're more equipped for those opportunities. I'd like to add, first of all, I think everybody's advice here is stellar. Um, I got into literary criticism by reviewing books on my own personal blog, which virtually no one read ever, except, except when a part-time job came up in a local market here for book reviewers. I essentially had examples of my work already done and I got hired because the editor looked and read my blog pieces uh, that were book reviews, okay? So um, it can, you've got to get your work out there some way, right? And some of us have to get started by doing it for free. Um, but the second thing I want to add is that when I started writing 20 years ago, I was not on social media. And social media has opened up the doors for people to do this work. What I tell all of my students is to get on Twitter, follow all your favorite publications, follow editors, follow uh, literary magazines and journals, and um, you will learn about calls for submissions. Um, right. Editors are very open. They want your work. You can use the search bar in Twitter. It's very effective. Type in submissions. Type in editors and you will pull up magazines and newspapers from all over the country hiring people for columns, for part-time jobs, for full-time jobs, um, for simply just opportunities to freelance for them. I see it all the time on Twitter. It's basically like the largest uh, bulletin board uh, for magazine and newspaper work. And um, and gosh, what I wouldn't have given 20 years ago to find out this information. Um, none of my friends were journalists back then. Um, I live far outside of Atlanta, so I do not have I did not have opportunities to network with people who were writers. And now, when you have uh, platforms like Twitter and can essentially be all of these opportunities are now accessible to you in your home, just using your internet connection. So definitely get on Twitter and start searching for opportunities to submit your work because they are there. That That's a great point. And I mean, I don't have a lot of followers on Twitter, but I love lurking. And you're right, literary Twitter and journalistic Twitter is full of information. And it's fun to follow your favorite authors and you're helping them because, in, you know, it. There's a lot of talk about being a literary citizen, and that's a pretty easy thing to do is follow someone and, and follow their work uh, and marvel at what they accomplished because it can be very inspiring. Um, I wanted to say another thing, uh, since you're talking about uh, Twitter, um, another site that I think is useful is called Muckrack. Um, and I'm not a very organized person, but it just will, <laughs> once you're on it, they just put a link to whatever you published. Um, and they don't catch everything, but they're pretty good. And that may just help you kind of organize all your submissions that have been published, especially digitally. Um, I don't think it can catch everything in print, but it will catch something if you uh, publish online somewhere. And um, I know with the Houston Chronicle now, whenever I publish, let's say a theater review, it will go online first. And weirdly, Monday is like they're heavily, a heavily trafficked day. 
I didn't know all this. Uh, and then it will run in print. And so, you know, that digital format, you know, many, many people will only read things digitally. So it's, it's uh, you know, maybe even 10 years ago, there was a little ambivalence like, well, you know, I really want something in print. But now, you know, the digital landscape has changed all that. There's no better than or less than. It's just a variety of formats. Any advice uh, in addition to that that anyone has, even about like writing? I mean, digital, like a magazine might be the venue and digital might be the format, but you have to have something to put out there. Um, so are, does anyone have any comments on that? Um, I would say, I think the, the the hardest part is coming up with an idea or finding a story. Like I'm struggling right now for a publication that wants me to send them a pitch and, and I'm trying to come up with something. Once you've got that, um, you know, just reporting and research is the main thing. And then it's sort of like the writing will just flow. That's what I find though. I, I mean, and I write strictly journalism. I don't, I, I've, written literary and I have 100% rejections. So I'm sticking with journalism. <laughs> so. you know, I well, would say, or uh, my advice would be, you know, number one, kind of know your audience, right? Because what your audience says could, would probably should affect the writing. So for example, if I'm doing like a business article versus a literary criticism versus writing for a children's magazine, the tone will be very different. That right. can make a huge difference. Having a right tone can make a difference between getting accepted or rejected. So that's one thing I've learned. And so the way, the way I find a tone is by reading articles in the field I'm writing in. If I read other, other writers, I can kind of cast your tone and see how they're writing and apply it to my own writing. To add, um, join, if you are able to pay the membership fees, join journalists organizations. I'm a, I'm a member of the uh, Asian American Journalists Association, and we have an Atlanta chapter. And these folks are my friends. They're my community. They're constantly sharing opportunities. Um, there's the American Society of Journalists and Authors. There's the Society of Professional Journalists. Many of these organi organizations have local chapters. They have annual conferences. Um, they have social media handles that give you, uh, you know, introduce you to opportunities of workshops that they have. Most of them now are online since the pandemic started. Um, and the Authors Guild is another uh, great organization. They're mainly for authors, um, so for people who write books, but a lot of their online workshops are great for all writers, um, including people who only write for magazines and newspapers. Um, I mean, I've gotten, it's, you know, I never got a degree in journalism, either undergrad or graduate. So I felt, um, I felt the need very early on for some kind of consistent educational component for myself, right? Um, like I kind of needed to learn the craft. I needed to learn um, how to do basic things. And, um, and journalism organizations um, have given me an invaluable education that I would not have had otherwise. Can I, I, I'm sorry, I have to jump in here because I'm the president of the Houston chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists, and I'm glad you prompted me oh, to great. mention that. Oh, great, that's great. And our next program actually is going to be on, if I can just plug the organization Absolutely. on, um, June 1st from 11.30 to 12.30, we're doing a program um, in uh, partnership with the Houston Chronicle on covering, guess what, because we're in Houston, hurricanes, so, and how to do that safely. So I'll put, probably following us on Facebook is the best way to do it. That's okay if I, I I'm not self-promoting. No, I, no, I think that <laughs> I absolutely want everyone to self promote and plug and tell us these things because that's what we're here for to learn these things and I mean I'm definitely interested in that I lost everything in Hurricane Harvey so I'm super interested in that and um, that's wonderful Ruth I think everyone no I think that's great because sometimes you just don't know about these things um, one thing I did want to say about the writing is um, you know I just think it's really important to read a lot um, and not just about what you write. I think that 
it's important to expose yourself to a lot of different styles. Like even if you are writing in a journalistic format, it still has to be interesting. And I think that journalism is changing a little bit. For example, you know, uh, you don't think of newspapers as a go-to place for the personal essay. But over the last 10 years, you know, for example, the Chronicle has been great to work with and they've published a lot of personal essays that I've written that weren't book reviews or, or uh, TV reviews. Um, I've done a lot of reviews of poetry. Well, they're running that because no, nobody else is really working on that. So it's something different, especially if the poet's from Houston. So I think that, yes, there are conventions to follow. You don't want to be too far, far off the territory. However, I think it's good to have your own voice because they are looking for distinctive writing. And if you, you know, if what you're writing brings something different and fresh, I think that's a wonderful thing uh, because uh, you will stand out from, from other writers, especially if it's in features where there's a little more elasticity, I think. We had a question in the comments about the uh, link. Is the, the site that you were recommending muckrack.com? Yeah, yes, it is. And I saw that, but I don't, I can't answer on my phone. There's no chat for me to answer, but Chris, that's correct. Muckrack.com. And there's another one called Authory, but I, I'm not familiar with that. So I'm not sure, but I think it's a similar kind of thing. I use Muckrack and I also use LinkedIn for just like everything I've ever written is on there. Okay. So, oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm just I'm new to LinkedIn, but I've heard, I, I feel late to the party. I think that is a really important site. Uh, does anyone have any experiences they want to share? Maybe something great that happened. Maybe something that didn't go well writing digitally or freelancing that you learned from that would be helpful to other people. Well, I mean, the worst thing that can happen to you is that the article doesn't get accepted. I mean, you know, it, it, it's not like there's an enormous uh, stake. And I, I, you know, I guess if you're new, you know, maybe you have a lot of anxiety about maybe, maybe you're developing a reputation by not getting accepted. But my expectation is that there are so many submissions that, you know, not having one of them accepted isn't gonna like create a name for you and it's not gonna pigeonhole you and it's not gonna limit you in the future. I mean, you're, you're free to write things that you, know, you think people wanna read and to find sites that look like they enjoy publishing this kind of thing you know, and, and approach them. And you know, I've, I've gotten uh, fiction reviews of mine you know, published in a variety of places online, sometimes just by me contacting the, you know, person who, you know, runs the site using their contact page saying, you know, I've written reviews in other places. Would you like one of my reviews on your site? And, right. uh, you know, it's, um, you know, the, the, the worst thing they can possibly do is not say yes. And it, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, that, that's a great point. And um, one, one thing I've learned is, you know, don't take things too personally. I mean, sometimes they just don't have the column space or sometimes it's just not a fit for that month or, you know, there's just a million factors that go into it. And so I would just say, be persistent. And um, Anjali, I mean, I follow you on Twitter. I mean, you've published so much. I mean, do you have any experience uh, to share, you know, what, it sounds like you submit a lot. And so in some ways it is a numbers game. And Chris, you're right. Like if it gets rejected, you know, so what? You just get up and try again. But I mean, um, there's either another site to submit it or, you know, there's another piece to submit there. Right. Yeah. So I've got two, two things, uh, you know, one was uh, something I wish I knew. And it was, it, it was an error I made early on which is that most newspapers and magazines do not allow simultaneous submissions. Meaning if you're going to pitch an idea to them, you only pitch to them and you have to wait, wait to hear a yes or a no before you pitch that piece to another publication. 
I learned this the hard way. I did not know. I had come from a more literary world where I was submitting work to literary journals and magazines. Sure. Yeah. And you, you simultaneous, simultaneous submissions are allowed. You can send out the same essay to 10 editors and whoever grabs it first wins. Okay. Yes. So, um, so that's one thing uh, I wanted to bring up. The second thing is remember that if you get a piece accepted, it's an opportunity for you to build a long-term relationship with this editor and have some kind of regular gig going. So be as uh, professional as possible from the get-go because uh, your first piece that you pitch and gets accepted is kind of, it can be an audition for a long-term role for that editor. Um, you know, I used to do most of my career was cold pitching editors um, and never having a relationship with them. But I've since now developed regular relationships with editors so that I'm now solicited for most of the pieces that I write instead of, you know, the act of pitching, which is oftentimes very time consuming and it's labor that you don't get paid for, right? So, um, I mean, sometimes it's taken me 20 hours to pitch a story idea for a story that only took me three hours to write it. So you have an opportunity when you pitch pieces to build some kind of relationship. And this includes even if you're rejected. I mean, there've been editors who have rejected me over and over and over again, but because of my persistence, then ended up reaching out, out, out to me and saying, okay, well, I don't like any of your other ideas, but could you write a piece on this? And so I've built a relationship with an editor through rejections. Um, so keep in mind that there's always the potential for long-term irregular work from magazines and newspapers. Even if they don't like your idea, maybe they will then think of you as someone as being you know, persistent and someone who writes a really clear and concise pitch letter. Because remember, your pitch letter is your audition, right? It should be the same quality as an article that you write. So if you show editors that you can write a good pitch letter, maybe they'll come back to you and be like, okay, you've been pitching me this idea for this. I'm not interested, but here is uh, a film festival coming up uh, in a few months. Would you like to write about this film festival? Because they know the quality of your work through your pitch letters. So always keep it in the back of your head that freelancing and pitching articles is a way to open the door for a regular gig. Um, and so don't get discouraged if you, even if you get rejected because editors will remember the people who they reject repeatedly. And they may build a relationship with you from that rejection process that then leads ultimately to a byline for you. And I think that, that's, editor, that's sorry. excellent. Sorry. No, I was just saying that was an excellent point. Go ahead. Yeah. Really all editors want, this is what I think, is good content on time period. And also they don't want you to be a pain in the neck, but that's it. You know, you don't really necessarily have to schmooze or anything like that, like you might in other fields. And also with being on time, stay within your word count because yeah. they, they, they're not trying to limit your creativity or your writing. Sometimes that's just the word count they have. And, and if you go over, that is creating a problem for them. So um, there's that, but I uh, also kind of related uh, to what Anjali was just saying is sometimes there's a lot of turnover, at, particularly at magazines. And so if you, let's say you've written for a magazine and they change arts editors, because that's what I would write in. I would, I still would be able to write for that magazine because they knew they had a, a history of my pieces with them. So that made that easy for the next editor to just take my work and not, they didn't have to go hunt for someone new. So you can build a reputation either with a particular editor or with a publication. And I worked at Houstonia, I worked with, I don't know, there was a lot of turnover, six editors. And I really enjoyed working with all of them for different reasons. Uh, and I learned, I really learned a lot from all of them. Uh, and so that was an, a, a really great experience. Yeah, one thing I'll add, uh, so far, that was awesome advice. I, I really love what Anjali was saying. Um, it kind of got a couple of thoughts in my head, too. Uh, the biggest rule before, the biggest advice I have is, like she was saying, just make sure you follow the rules of the publication. Because right. if you consistently don't follow rules, it can kind of get you blacklisted from a publication. The other mm -hmm. thing I would add is, you know, 
polite manner will take you very far in the industry. Just being polite, being cordial, um, that can give you a lot of opportunities. Even I can give you a couple of examples. A couple of examples. The way I got my agent for my books was the first time I submitted to his agent for my books. She rejected it, but I guess I was real polite with her the whole process. And next time I submitted my next book to her, my book automatically was on the top of her reading list, and she picked that book up. Even I also also my writing, I work as an editor as well, in magazine. And I can tell you from an editor's perspective, authors who are polite, who are nice, who seem like good people, they get a bigger consideration than authors who are abrupt or rude or different things like that. I I agree, and um, you know sometimes it something bad can happen, but it can turn out to be good no matter depending on how you handle it. So I had to do this review of this play on sex trafficking and I, I really went off the rails with the piece. I got really upset about sex trafficking. So I started covering all these nonprofits that fight it. And so my piece was just a hot mess. But my editor, he said, look, I can't publish this. You're supposed to be talking about a play. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I hate it too. I, I, I don't know what, I don't know what's happened to me. This is just a mess. Let me fix it. So two things happen. It's easier to work with people who can admit they've made a mistake. And I, I mean, there was no getting around it. I just, I don't know what happened. I just, I had a bad day and I just was not handling the piece well. But I called the theater. I told them I need help. They were wonderful. I totally redid it and it ran in Sunday print. So sometimes recovering from a mistake can also say something about you and how you know you're willing to admit it when you're wrong and you're also willing to fix it and so I think that um helped me a lot with this editor um because he could see that I was trying and that I I didn't want to leave him with a problem I wanted to address it uh anybody else I'd just like to underscore the point that uh, Anjali and Amar made about the, the human interaction element of this. I mean, if an editor has a tall stack of, you know, submissions and a choice to make who they're going to work with, um, you know, if there's four pieces that are kind of similar in quality, you don't think they're going to prefer to pick the one whose author is easy to work with and a pleasure to interact with. You know, if, if somebody is, you know, hostile and abrasive and makes them feel bad when they're doing the work, you know, even if their piece is good, are they going to want to volunteer into that? You know, they have plenty of things happening in their life without <laughs> electing into more trouble. You know, it's not like they're going to get, you know, fired based on not picking something, you know, I mean, even if it runs somewhere else because it, the quality is good, it's not like they're going to get judged. So it's, it's, you know, there's, there's nothing to be lost, um, being polite, reasonable, friendly, um, and everything to be gained because these are human beings, you know, and they're, they're not machines. They're, it's, it's not like you're going to put a quarter in and push a button and get the drink. It's, you know, they're, <laughs> they have feelings, <laughs> even, even the ones you don't see because it's an online submission process, you know, your written communications you know, if, if you're abrupt and harsh, it feels different. You know, if, if you're polite, you know, like Amar said, the politeness uh, that can get you places. Although I would say there's definitely a difference between newspaper editors and magazine editors, because the newspaper editors, you know, magazine editors have a longer lead time. And so newspaper editors can be a bit more abrupt themselves. Sure. I'm sure you find that sure. funny. Well, and, um, and if, and if it's a but yes, you still have to be nice. Matters. Huh? Sorry. Oh, said, and, and if it's a print publication, the word count really, really matters. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But yes, you do have to be nice back. So. <laughs> right. And also, I, th I think Ruth makes an excellent point. Um, from my understanding, you know, I've never worked full-time at a newspaper or a magazine, but, you know, they're working with fewer resources. They often have one editor covering every category of the arts, you know, everything from ballet to books. And so, you know, they're under tight deadlines. So 
be super nice to them, even if they're abrupt with you, is my advice. Because, you know, they just, they have a lot on them, I think. Oh, and another important thing when you're getting ready to pitch, research and make sure that you're not pitching what they just ran like within the last 12 months because that will really piss off an editor <laughs> so um that's important that is important any other great experiences or uh i'd like to hear everyone's current projects and then i think we should take some questions from our comrades at the conference. I am currently in the middle of trying my darndest to figure out uh, a story for an editor, as you were saying, Anjali, who is familiar with my work and happy with me. And so he said, I need a submission for the July, August issue. And I need that piece in by May 15th. So I'm like, ah. So if anybody has, yeah, a great story idea. That's what I'm doing right now. That's great. <laughs> so I always have like a bunch of stuff going on at the same time. So I'll talk about the next um, pub, uh, product to be released. So my next pub, uh, product to be published is an anthology actually, working with Titan Books. Um, and they're working with 20th Century Studios, which are owned by Disney. The anthology is based on the movie franchise Predator from the 80s and 90s. So they have, they have a new movie coming out in the summer. So the anthology is like an offshoot of the movie. So that's coming out in August in 2022. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Anjali and Chris, what about y'all? Just had a piece come out in Atlanta Magazine about um, Gathering Blossoms Under Fire, which is the, um, it's the edited book by Valerie Boyd, who recently passed away, of Alice yeah. Walker journals. Um, and my next piece for Atlanta Magazine is going to be um, an interview with the Ukrainian-American poet Ilya Kaminsky. Oh, um, I love him. Yeah, so, um, you know, we're, we're talking about not just poetry, but Ukrainian poetry and what's happening in Ukraine right now. Um, he is originally from Odessa, which is obviously um, seeing a lot of this war happening right now. Um, and um, I, I'm doing, I'm mainly doing now a book reviews and articles about liter literature and authors. Um, I did a lot of really heavy reporting on voting and elections and voting rights leading up to the 2021 runoff election. And that burned me out in ways that I cannot describe. So I have sort of retreated to writing about the literary world, which is kind of my first love anyways. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm contemplating now whether I would want to get back into more political writing. There are so many more hard and fast deadlines with writing about politics. Um, oh, yeah. And I've really, uh, really appreciated the sort of the break I have with writing about literature, which is, you know, you find out months in advance when a book is coming out so it's 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 a it's a slower type of freelance life so i'm luxuriating in 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 this literary what realm uh and it's a nice break from the political writing that i did before it that's great chris you, what's your project uh well the the next thing that i am likely to write that is related to this topic um you know, getting back to things like the, the war in Ukraine and things like this, um, I, I've been contemplating writing a piece that talks trash about the idea of investing in uh, tyrannies, um, where, as we've seen, you know, in Russia, if, if they don't, if they don't like the country you're from, you know, they'll just sort of declare that the assets are seized and declare that, you know, Russians are running it. And it's like people who are leasing planes to uh, Russian operators, um, you know, Putin declared that the Russians now owned them, you know. <laughs> so how are you going to get that plane back? You know, it's it maybe millions and millions and millions of dollars and that sucker is gone. So yeah. uh, I think, I think the next thing that I write is going to, um, um, I'm, 
I'm going to try to pitch the idea that only a fool would invest in these tyrannies um, while act, you know, while appearing to promote companies whose risk aversion wisely kept them out of it in the first place. Um, so I'm, I kind of have a political agenda, um, but it's going to be an investment piece. Uh, that's, <laughs> awesome. that's, what, that's, great. that's what the site publishes that I write, and I'm, so I'll, I'll do that. That's right. And uh, Ruth is also doing a piece on religion and the environment, mm -hmm. which sounds fascinating to me. Um, so I, uh, the first piece I wrote for the Houston Chronicle, I actually didn't send it to them. Um, the dean at my school, I wrote this piece on taking my son to the museums in Houston. So, I mean, this was not investigative reporting. Uh, but my dean sent it to Kiri O'Connor, who was the features editor at the Chronicle at the time, and she ran that piece in print, and it got a letter to the editor. Now, in Houston, the only letters to the editor are about two things, politics and football. So <laughs> here, here, you know, there was this response to this ordinary person going to museums in Houston, and I never even thought I could write this kind of thing and have it published. So... Since, so what I'm working on now is, um, since then, I've, I don't know, done, I don't know, 200 and plus pieces. So I'm trying to collect the essays that are not, that don't have an expiration date, uh, the personal essays uh, into a book. And I'm getting some help with that from some of my colleagues. Uh, and I still think the personal essay is a wonderful form. And uh, I think that for various reasons, it's very appealing to people right now. Uh, so I'm working on that. And um, these essays are everything from that museum visit to hearing Eric Gerber, who used to be the meteorologist for the Houston Chronicle. Now he has this Space City weather site. Uh, he gave a talk on NASA's funding of the space program. And so I just wrote about taking my son to this talk and how mind blowing it was. I mean, he was just fascinating and I, I, I just, you know, I don't know, it was just a revelation to hear him talk about so many things. Mm -hmm. So I'm collecting those things. And then I have a, a review of Apollo 8, speaking of space, coming out in the Chronicle, uh, a play being put on by the AD players. So it's kind of a preview slash interview with the new artistic director, Jamie McGann, who I used to teach with at my university he's coming back to Houston. And so that, that'll be a change for that theater. Uh, so that's very exciting. But I'm trying to shift from just freelancing to collecting things into book form. Some freelance things, you know, that moment is over, you published it, you, you know, it's a review or something timely. And uh, it's hard for that to be kind of a, a permanent exhibit. So, that's, that's what I'm working on right now. And then I have academic writing to keep my job, but that's, that's another animal. So why don't we, uh, any, any last thoughts from the panel before we take questions? Um, you know, I just wanted to say, um, cause I've seen some references to LinkedIn and y'all have touched on this already, but I just wanted to emphasize that, um, you know, especially when you're starting out, you really do need to have some kind of online presence. You need a, 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 a warehouse for your clips and your writing, whether it's just a blog on Medium, and I don't mean to say just there, but whether it's a blog on Medium or a blog on your own website, um, because editors can sometimes just find you that way. Um, so, you know, get active on social media, eventually get some kind of website up with all of your clips. Um, I, I, I'll put my website in the chat in case it's helpful to, for people to see how I've done it. But on my web page, I have an entire like section that's just clips with links to all of my clips. Um, because sometimes editors find you, they, they, they see something that, you know, you've, you've posted on Twitter that you wrote then they go to your Twitter profile, then they see that you have a website, and then they start looking at all of your clips. And I've had editors reach out to me because they find me through my work, and then they're able to read lots of sample pieces that I've published, and then approach me out of the blue um, because they've read a lot of my writing. So make sure you have an online presence um, and that it's part of your signature when you sign off emails. 
Um, and then when you write pitch letters, have hyperlinks to some of your pieces that are relevant to what you're pitching. Um, be very, very visible online um, because you're not just, it's not about you just looking for editors, but of editors being able to find you. And if it's too hard for them to find you and examples of your writing, they're not going to bother because they've got a hundred other pitches sitting in their inbox. So make it very, very easy to be found online. Do that legwork for editors and you might ha have people reaching out to you who you've never even written for. You know, that's an excellent point because I'm meeting you for the first time, but I knew about you before today through your online presence. And that, you know, and that's great because uh, then when you do meet someone, uh, let's say you meet an editor, you have something to talk about with that person because you've, you've already kind of met them through social media. And, uh, you know, all these editors are people and they want to work with people they can have conversations with. Um, you know, my dissertation director, when I was up for a job, she said, remember, they want to hire a person, a real person. And so I think that is excellent advice. advice and you're, you're inspiring me to get on that because my online presence is a little uh, scattered. But I think, I think you're right. And uh, I think doing that foundational work will pay off in the long run because people do not have to hunt for you. You know, uh, I think that's wonderful advice. Um, all right. Any, uh, I cannot, okay. On my phone, I cannot see everything. So, um, maybe we could have participants say, or, uh, ask their questions out loud and, uh, address it to whomever they wish to address. I, I don't think that participants yeah. can be seen or heard. I think they can only type into the chat. Okay. So why don't we have people type into the chat and, uh, we'll take it that way. Uh, and Ruth just passed it her website, her muckrack and LinkedIn presence. Um, okay, now I'm finally getting a q and I think that's from Ruth. Yeah. Okay, someone's asking for uh, Anjali's clips. Yes, so um, do I, okay. Yeah, she pasted it in the chat. Oh, it's in the chat. Okay, I see a Q and A. Sorry. Yeah. Here, I can paste the link. That's yeah. that's the link that you uh, put in the chat. I now put it in the Q and A. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, thank Great. you. I appreciate I'm sorry. I'm I'm. I think I'm supposed to be able to do that stuff, but I can't. I I can't. I can't open no, no, I mean, it something and my laptop like completely crashes. So anyway, thank you for doing that, Chris. No, no trouble. Well, while we're waiting, I wanted to revisit something you said, Anjali, which is I'm not sure it's a hard and fast rule that you can't simultaneously submit. It's just risky i i just recently did it and fortunately you know the the one well the first one just dragged their feet so i had a reason not to do it and i just said i'm sorry i had to run it and i ran it in the other you know publication so it's risky but yeah and there are ways to tackle it so what i do especially if something is timely is that I deadline the first editor. So I, I will say, you know, in my subject header, I will say very timely pitch. And then at the end of it, if I know this needs to run soon, I will say, if I have not heard from back from you in three days, I'll assume you're not interested in pitch elsewhere. Um, that's the safest way to do it. Um, it, it. You're right, it is not a hard and fast rule, but the majority of editors do not like simultaneous pitches. And unless you can find contradictory information on the on websites, or you can ask an editor, or you can get information otherwise, I would assume that they don't want simultaneous pitches. But you have power as uh, as the journalist to deadline them within a short time period, um, so that you don't have to drag it out. Where like you know, a week later you're following up and then five days later you're following up and then you're deadlining them, you can do it right off the top. They yeah. might not like it, but you are, you are, it's, it's courteous. It's, it's, they understand that some things are timely 
and they have to get back to you quickly or else they, they uh, lose a chance at, at losing the piece. That's I've just true. been, I, I literally had this editor blackball me after my experience and I just don't want people to have that happen um, because uh, some of them will not be very understanding and will be very, very upset if you write back to them and say that you sold the piece elsewhere when they thought that they were, that they could still consider it. Because remember, it's not just the editor that makes the decision. Sometimes the editor has to consult with somebody at a meeting that they have once a week where they go through all the pitches that they thought were interesting. And, you know, they might be talking to uh, coworkers about the pitch to try to figure out how it will work. So if they're doing that behind the scenes, while you're waiting to hear back and then you tell them, oops, I sold it elsewhere, um, it's, it's not gonna go over well. So just kind of protect yourself where if you don't wanna wait long, you deadline the editor in the initial pitch. That's very smart, by the way, for something Anna, timely. <laughs> and uh, Ruth might wanna jump in on this because you've had more experience with the Houston Chronicle than I have. But one of the questions in the Q&A was, um, I think from Janet is, you know, we have this blog, can you submit that to the Houston Chronicle? And my experience has been yes. Um, I used to write for my university blog and if it would be a good piece, I would pitch it and sometimes they would take it. Uh, I think it just depends on the editor, but, but my experience has been yes. What do you think, Ruth? Well, make sure they know that it was published elsewhere, even if it was just, just your blog, make sure they know that it was published elsewhere. And yeah. they will say that, they would say this was first originally published here. Um, yeah, if so they choose to run it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then the other question, which... Uh, yeah, it says, what uh, books, courses, or resources do you recommend for folks who have a literary background but want to do journalistic writing? Okay, so I think that's several of us. Um, I don't... You know, there are a lot of how-to books, but... I think that your literary background is a huge asset for journalistic writing because you have a field of knowledge um, that I think is great. Um, so anyone, uh, anyone else? Anjali, you have a literary background and you write yeah, about Yeah, I, um, I was literary writing for many years before I got into journalism. So. Um, um, I was, for years, I was in the uh, Binders Facebook groups um, where people who had no writing experience, not, a, not even literary writing experience, um, were posting questions in there and there was a lot of support and sharing of resources. Um, I mentioned joining journalism organizations. I think those are fantastic. Um, if you are okay with paying for a service, um, Study Hall XYZ is a great resource. It's a Slack channel. Folks share spreadsheets. There's a spreadsheet with uh, lists of publications, what they pay, who the editors, what the editor's emails are. Um, I mean, there are, I find these resources much more valuable than books because books are out of date the day that they are published. But books about the publication world, like as soon as they come out, there's a better resource. Um, and I mentioned Twitter. Um, I know people who have gotten their entire education uh, from, from Twitter. Uh, it's it's uh, the source of most of my income is Twitter, is by uh, being solicited uh, from people on Twitter and finding opportunities to write on Twitter. Um, but uh, absolutely join a Facebook group for writers, uh, join a, uh, um, you know, follow your favorite uh, journalists on Twitter, see what they write. Um, follow editors and consider joining study hall. Um, there's a monthly fee. I can't remember what level I pay. It might be $13 a month. Um, I have easily made that money back based on articles that I've sold, um, but it's a really supportive environment. You ask questions and people, people will help you. If you're brand new, um, people will jump in and will help you. That's great. And uh, there is a book, I can't remember the author's name, but it's called Writing Short. And I think that's the biggest shift to journalism, like in academic writing, you can just go on forever. But for journalism, you know, when I'm told I have 700 words, if I, you know, usually I, you know, my brother passed away last year and the Chronicle wrote, ran this essay I wrote about him and growing up in the suburbs. And, you know, I could have written a whole book about my brother, but I had a thousand words and I was grateful for it because that's kind of a lot of words for a newspaper. So, um, and Ruth has lifted some things, uh, 
from the Society of Professional Journalists for freelance things. I think that the discipline of writing shorter pieces is really valuable. And, uh, you know, I love literature, I love long novels, but in our culture, people want something short, but it has to also be really good. And I think that learning how to write in a shorter format can be very gratifying because you are giving people information that they want uh, in a form that they will read.